This episode of Eat the Rules is brought to you by You on Fire. You on Fire is the online group coaching program that I run that gives you a step-by-step way of building up your self-worth beyond your appearance. With personalized coaching from me, incredible community support, and lifetime access to the program so that you can get free from body shame and live life on your own terms. Get details on what's included and sign up for the next cycle at summerinanin.com forward slash you on fire. I'd love to have you in that group. This is Eat the Rules, a podcast about body image, self worth, anti dieting, and intersectional feminism. I am your host, Summer Inanin, a professionally trained coach specializing in body image, self-worth, and confidence, and the best-selling author of Body Image Remix. If you're ready to break free of societal standards and stop living behind the number on your scale, then you have come to the right place. Welcome to the show. This is episode 267, and I'm joined by Martinez Evans, author of Slow AF Run Club, creator of the Slow AF Run Club, and the man behind the page 300 Pounds and Running. We're talking about how Martinez ran his first marathon after his doctor told him to either lose weight or die. And just to give you a little bit of a spoiler, he didn't actually lose weight. We talk about his relationship with his body and movement and how running helped revolutionize his perspective and view of himself. We talk about how to overcome barriers to moving your body and why every body is a runner. You can find the links mentioned at summerinanin.com forward slash 267. I want to give a shout out to Maddie L99 who left this review. Summer makes you feel great about being you. Fantastic podcasts. I always listen to Summer's podcasts in the morning when I'm doing my makeup. She makes me feel like I can face anything. I have recommended this to so many of my friends. Thank you so much, Maddie. It's always so nice to hear that you recommend it to other people. I really, really appreciate that. You can leave a review for the podcast by going to Apple Podcasts, search for Eat the Rules, click ratings and reviews, click to leave a review. Don't forget to grab the free guides that I have. If you want support, feeling better in your body, get the free 10-day body confidence makeover at summerinanin.com forward slash freebies. And if you are a provider or another type of professional who works with people or students who may have body image struggles, get the free body image coaching roadmap at summerinanin.com forward slash roadmap. I've been following Martinez online for a couple of years now and have always just really loved his energy and how he promotes the idea that, you know, anybody is, everybody is a runner and everybody is worthy of taking up space and being an athlete and how he makes it really accessible to everyone. And so I'm super excited to have him on the show today. Martinez Evans has run over eight marathons since his doctor told him to lose weight or die in July, 2012. Since then, he's also coached hundreds of runners and founded the Slow AF Run Club, a community of over 10,000 members worldwide. He is also the author of the book, Slow AF Run Club, the ultimate guide for anybody who wants to run. When he's not running races around the world, he enjoys speaking passionately about issues related to size inclusivity, mindset, DEI, and mental health. Let's get started with the show. Hello, Martinez. Welcome to the show. Summer, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you here. I was saying we haven't had a man. Actually, no, you know what? I did have a man on the show this season, but he wasn't talking about his own relationship with his body or anything like that or his own relationship with movement. So we haven't had someone on to really share, you know, their lived experience in in quite a while from that, from the male perspective. So I'm super excited to have you here. And especially because your book is coming out, which we are very, very excited about And I'd love for you to start off just by telling listeners, like, why did you decide to run a marathon? Oh, man. (laughs) It's a little bit more complicated than than me being like, well, you know, I just woke up one day to even take a step further. Back in 2012, I was working at Men's Warehouse at the time. So I was on my feet eight to 12 hours a day in hard bottom shoes, wearing suits. Right. And I started to develop some hip pain and I went to go see a doctor. 
And I never met this doctor a day in my life. It's my first time meeting this doctor. And he was telling me, and I, and I was telling him, like, you know, I'm, I'm having some hip pain, yada, yada, yada. And he's like, okay, I know what's, I know what's wrong with you. And okay, what, what's wrong with me? He was like, you're fat. You either need to lose weight or die. And I was like, what? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> and for a second, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't catch on for a second. So I was like, so what that got to do with my hip? Oh, you're trying to insult me. So then, you know, we have this argument and this debate because he went on like, you know, you got a stomach as a pregnant woman, all this other stuff. You need to start walking and blah, 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 and yada, yada, yada. And I remember him being like, well, what does any of that have to do with my hip? And then, you know, he continued to go on, finger thumbing, thumbing his nose, pointing, and I remember being like, you know, if I wanted to, I can run a marathon. And he he laughed at me and told me that's the most dumbest thing he heard in all of his years of practice of medicine. And I was like, screw this, screw you. And I left. And on my way home, I drove past a running shoe store and I bought running shoes. And that was like the start of my journey. Wow. Wow. Did you have any desire to run before that? Absolutely not. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, born out of spite. <laughs> it was born out of spite. You know, I was a weekend warrior. So the men's warehouse I was at, they was big into like flag football. So we played flag football almost, I won't say every weekend, but a lot of times throughout the time I was working there. So I played flag football a lot. I, you know, played basketball with friends and things of that sort. Like I was relatively active, right? But like running for fun, that was a punishment when I played football. Yeah. Yeah. Like, when you were training for the marathon, were there points in time where you were like, what am, what am I, why did I, why didn't I choose a different sport? Yes. <laughs> or why like, did I pick this thing? There were times when I was like, dang, like, why you couldn't say like, I'll swim or a bike or something else, underwater basket weave, like you chose running, huh? And I was like, yep, chose running. Yeah, but you did it. And it's amazing. We just had a marathon go by our city, like pretty close to my house recently. And I was just like, I could never do that. I, after reading your book, I'm like, maybe I could. You could. You can. <laughs> I, st I still don't you think can. I want to. <laughs> but, but your book actually like makes you believe, like, I mean, that's what's so great about it is that it's so motivational and, and encouraging. What was your relationship with like with fitness before? Like when you were, you know, when you were growing up, like, was it something that y you were into or was this kind of like a catalyst that really propelled you to like kind of focusing more on it as like a pursuit? I had a love hate relationship with fitness. You know, so I grew up as a little fat boy who was teased and bullied until it was able to be a commodity. So, you know, I was teased and bullied until I started playing football in my junior year of high school. So at that point, I became, you know, I became one of the cool kids because I was on the team. And, you know, my body was able to be a commodity for the sport of football. And like everybody enjoyed it and loved it. But before that, like it, it was it was crazy. Right. Like I, I, I done tons of things to try to make myself fit in. Like I grew like I grew up with man boobs. Like even one of my my experiences of like when I first found out that I was fat had to do with like me having man boobs at a younger uh, at a younger age. Yeah, yeah. How has your relationship with your body changed over time? It was one of those things where you have to learn to love throughout therapy and just understanding the the change of focus. Right. I really think that like for me when I really went from like potentially trying to like change my body to being like, you know what? I want to run and be active regardless of what size or shape I am. Like that was made me more happier than trying to change my body. Like once I did that, like everything just kind of flipped the switch. Like I went from that to like posing nude in men's health. So it's, it's an amazing journey. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. That's so that's like a really pivotal kind of mindset shift to then have that translate over into how you, you know, see yourself as a whole. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you mentioned men's health there. What do you think about the pressure that men face as it relates to their body and their appearance? 
Summer, have you ever seen a fat superhero? Have you ever seen a fat, like, you know, G.I. Joe with a Kung Fu grip? No. Fat no. Superman or Spider-Man or a- any other superhero or toys that boys play with? No. And I have a little boy. So, no, I have not. And I've- Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, it's there. <laughs> you know, it's in it's in our toys. It's It's in ingrained of like what the messages they send to boys it's there there's no way of getting around it and i experienced that as well Mm -hmm. do you you see it getting worse like i observe it like the the kind of standard for men becoming almost like worse like more muscular more like shredded so to speak than it maybe was like 10 20 years ago I would say with the advent of the Marvel movies, like all of the MCU stuff, where like superheroes really became like the mainstream thing that we consumed. Any Marvel movie or just any movie, like the press is like, oh, look at, you know, such and such body, like follow such and such training body to get this jet to be become Thor, whoever, whoever, right? So I think that it's always been there, but I think that with the advent of like most of our modern media being, or like, you know, things that we watch being like these superhero movies and things of that sort that's been the most successful, it's, it's there, right? I, I think about when Creed 3 came out. It was a Creed 3? One of the Creeds, right? When, you know, they had both of the actors being like, look at their workouts, like, look how they transformed their body to do X, Y, and Z, and yada, yada, yada. It is there. Yeah. And oftentimes it's like extraordinarily disordered. And it, but I find when they talk about it as it relates to men, it's more uh, like normalized. And so, I mean, it is as well with women or any gender, I should say, but like it's, it, it seems it, it kind of goes under the radar of being labeled disordered. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, they're biohacking or, oh, they're just like, you know, like building muscle. But a lot of times the behaviors are the same, like disordered patterns that you see across all genders. Absolutely. Yeah. So I want to talk to you about your book. Like what inspired you to write slow AF do you want me to do you say the word like what's the best way to do it do you just do you just you say af <laughs> yeah we, we say slow af you know i like okay. to keep the like to keep the af ambiguous you know never know when disney might come around and be like hey we want to buy your turtle or whoever so you know i try to keep it i try to keep it a little pd 13 but we all know what af mean <laughs> <laughs> but the reason why i wrote this book so my world revolves around slow AF run club. So I have a club. We have about 10,000 members worldwide. I'm wearing this merch, you know, this wonderful hoodie. Everything I do, everything in my life revolves around slow AF run club. So as I was training our members, both on a one-on-one and uh, group basis, a lot of members asked me, hey, Martinez, are there any books that you recommend that we read? Or like, are there any books that we can learn how to be more of a better runner? Yada, yada, yada. And most of the time, my answer was no. Because most running books are written by, well, most how-to running books are written by elite athletes, you know, or former elite athletes or coaches of elite athletes telling you how to run fast like them. And for the majority of the population, that information is useless. You know, that information is just, just flat out useless, right? And I remember when I came became a certified run coach and they gave me this book called, I think it's called the Daniels Book on Running, Jack Daniels Book on Running. And it's, you know, B.02, you know, very scientific, very dry, very formulaic. These are the things you need to do. Very rigid, you know, was not any accessibility. And I remember getting my certification and them being like, this is the Bible, like your running Bible. Everything you need to learn about running is in this book. So, Imagine, you know, trying to train your first person and their pace is not in the pace chart in the back of the book. You know, how does that how does that really equip you to be a run coach? Right. And one of the things, other things I learned about is that, like I said, most of the information there was not tailored to the individuals that I coach. For example, like they need information of like, hey, Summer, you finna go run for the first time. 
don't wear cotton underwear. Don't wear cotton anything because you're going to be chafe. The chafe monster is going to get you. Or like, hey, you think, you know, you're going to miss a meal or like not eat before you go run. Let me tell you a time where I did that and I ended up on the side of the road and I had to call my wife to come get me. So don't do that. Right. So, you know, there is not a book out there that provide these types of things of do this or like, let's come together. Let's go on this journey together. Everything is very formulaic and like do this, not that type of thing. Yeah. And one of the things that you cover first in your book is mindset. And you talk about how that is really, that really needs to be, you know, a a priority. I'm assuming most of the kind of like mainstream books perhaps don't cover that. I don't know. I would never read a mainstream running book. (laughs) But why did you prioritize that? Like, why, why did you, why did, why do you feel mindset so important? Because a lot of the individuals that I work with, one of the things that I have to do as a coach is provide psychological safety so that they, they're they able to feel whatever they're feeling so they can get to the next step. Most of these books, most of these coaches don't do that. But that's what we're doing, providing psychological safety. So it only makes sense for me in my mind that if I'm training people and I'm coaching people and the first thing that we're doing is mindset right off rip, you know, trying to get them to understand that, yes, you are a runner. And yes, you belong. And yeah, you may have some horrible experiences back in the day, but today it's going to be different. If I, if I, if that's what I do in my everyday life, when the first time I meet somebody to train them, it only made sense for me to organize that book in the same way that I like train somebody. Mm -hmm. So you said something there that I think really resonated with me personally, is that like, you know, if someone thinks like, well, I'm not a runner, which is something that I've always said, because I was always dead last growing up, like literally dead last to the point that I just started to embrace it and walk the whole thing because that was less painful for me than to try and be last. (laughs) So so I've never identified with being a runner. And yet I do usually try to kind of go for a jog like once a week. But tell me about like why you know, it's okay to say like, well, you are a runner. Like, because you are like runner just means the act like a person running. Right. So every, any and everybody can call themselves as a runner. Like if you get up and you start running, like it, yeah. it's, in, it's in the definition. So I think that's the thing. And, and I think the other thing is just really getting people to take ownership in their body and in the things that they're going to do. So it's one thing to be like, oh, you're just a person trying to run uh, such and such. No, you are a runner. You are an athlete. So I need you to get in that athlete mindset so that you know that there's going to be obstacles in the way in order to get to your goals. And you need to crush those obstacles, period. Yeah, I think so many of us struggle with those identifications because they've always been associated with a particular archetype, like whether it's yeah. looking a certain way or performing at a certain level. And so even like the word athlete, even though like I do athletic endeavors, I still would never like use that word. I'm trying to, cause I, you're not, the, <laughs> you're not the only person who's kind of said this to me, but <laughs> trying to kind of like, you know, embrace that identity just because it, it means you're just participating in something. It doesn't yes. mean you, you look a particular way or you perform a particular way, but it's so hard. <laughs> you know, calling yourself an athlete, calling yourself a runner means that you're in it. You're in the arena. Yeah. So if you are in the arena, you got to do things that that solidify that you are in the arena. So getting people to really understand that to help flip that switch on and provide them that psychological safety to say like, hey, one of the things that athletes do is become consistent in their training. The way to do that is to overcome the boredom that comes with consistency. Nobody ever told me that becoming doing things consistently isn't boring. But it is. And I wish that if we were real with it to say that sometimes it's doing the boring, unsexy stuff that actually gets us to our goals, that actually gets us to be on the stage, on a podium, put our hands up, yada, yada, yada. So by becoming an athlete and thinking yourself as an athlete, you then know that there's going to be consistency. 
There's going to be hardship. There's going to be things that you're going to have to overcome and you will overcome those because you are an athlete and you know that you've already done something harder in the past that you can look at so you can then go forward and keep going. I love that. So are you saying that like to embrace the boredom of consistency or are there ways to make that consistency less boring? No, you just got to embrace it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, we, we can try different tricks and habits and things of that sort, but like consistency to, in my head equals boredom. Yeah. You know, like doing the same thing over and over again, like that's how you become proficient at something and somebody might see that and like dang you're running 20 miles today what are you thinking nothing (laughs) or like what are you thinking like how do you go through this like aren't you bored and my my answer is well this is the thing that i have to do in order to run a marathon i gotta run the 20 miles like there's no way of getting around it so if i'm bored if i'm talking to a friend or listening to music i have i still have to do it Yeah, because I think, that you know, like in the sort of like anti-diet space, there's this idea of like engaging in, in, you know, what people refer to as like joyful movement, Uh which, you know, like I feel like is kind of like one note because I do often feel a lot of the time, sometimes when we're actually in something like it doesn't feel so joyful, but afterwards we feel really joyful. And I feel like that's kind of similar here. It's like you might be bored or it might be just really hard, but it's it's sort of the pride that you get after that gives you that like, you know, sense of accomplishment and sense of joy. Yes. It's the, it's the accomplishment of you set your mind up to do something. Mm -hmm. And not only did you set your mind up to do it and not let it go off in the ether, you took the next step and the next step and the next step over and over and over again. And knowing that, you know, there might be some times where you slept up, But guess what? You slipped up and you accepted what happened and you kept going versus what typically happened in a typical diet culture type thing is that somebody slips up and then like that's the worst thing that has happened to them. And then like the routine is done and like everything has fell off the wheels. When you're an athlete and having that athlete mindset, you know that you're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. You know, imagine if LeBron James had one bad game and he just fell to pieces for the rest of the season. He wouldn't be the athlete or the, the the player that he is, but we all know that we compete. We, we stay in the moment to do the thing and then we move on to the next thing. Yeah. So what's your advice to someone who, you know, might feel self-conscious starting? Cause I think that's something that I run into a lot with clients is even just like going for a walk in their neighborhood feels really scary because they feel like they're opening themselves up to judgment. So what's your advice to someone who might be feeling that way? One of the things I usually tell people was that like, and we all know this, like you've said harder and harsher things to yourself. I've said the worst things that I can to myself, worse than anything nobody, anybody else can say to myself. So you really going to let somebody, the thought of somebody else say something to you, stop you when you've already said worse of things to yourself. Why? So, you know, that's my thing is to, to get people to understand is that sometimes we're, we are our, our worst enemy. We are literally our worst enemy. The thoughts that we have in our head, the things that we got going on that can stop us. And then all you're doing is looking for validation to say like, see, somebody called me fatter. See, somebody told me this. Stop waiting on that validation and just do it. And I know that's the hard thing, right? Like saying, just do it. You know, people are like, well, that's, that's hard. I know that. So how about this? Can you do it afraid? Can you take the first step knowing that you're afraid to start and you do it anyway? Because here's what happened. When we do something afraid and we actually do the thing, we start to realize that our mind makes up like these scenarios where they're actually worse than like what the outcome can possibly be. be. So like, let's weigh the options. And this is what I do with my my clients. Let's weigh the options. Let's, let's go through the whole scenario. You out walking, somebody, you know, somebody look at you weird. So like, what's the worst that can happen? They just look at you and you look at them back and it's like, well, why are they looking at me? They must be thinking X, Y, and Z wave at them. Hey, how you doing? Acknowledge them. 
let them know that you you see them looking at you. You know, let's let's go down the scenarios. Okay, you walk in and somebody call you fat. So in my eyes, fat, fat is a descriptor. That's like saying you got blonde hair. Thank you. Thank you for stating the obvious. So like once we take the power away from these things and really think about like what's the worst case scenario, we really start to understand that what we're really afraid of is like the success that actually might come from it if we actually do the thing and be successful. Yeah. Tell me more about that. Like, did you, did you, did you experience that? Like that fear of being successful at it? Yeah. You know, I think the thing is that growing up as a little black boy in Detroit, you know, where I grew up on the East side of Detroit, I've had two brothers pass on me before the age of 10. You I'm know, so sorry. I, I, thank you. I stayed next to a crack house. So I experienced all these things, right? And there's always people was telling me that you're going to end up like your brothers. You're going to end up dead or in jail. And, you know, that stuff gets in your subconscious. So then what you start to do is self-sabotage because you're like, well, they're right. And, and I think that's what happens for most individuals is that they are on the journey and then they self-sabotage because I've done it as well. Yeah. So speaking of self-sabotage, like you talk about running your first marathon and I mean, I know you kind of tell the story in the book, so I sort of know the answer or the, uh-huh. or the answer, but I, I would love just to hear it in your words. Like, did you want to quit? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Even when I go running now, like people think like, oh, like that urge to, to quit just goes away. No, it's still there. <laughs> okay. How do you work around it? One of the things you you start to realize is that it's usually once you get past like the first 10 to 20 minutes, that feeling goes away. It's almost like so when I was writing a book and this is how more or less I think about all things in in journey in life. Right. Is you got to break it down to the most simplest things. So when I wrote this book, they told me, all right, Martinez, we need you to come back with seventy five thousand words. I re- and I remember being like 75,000 words. What? So like when you look at that big number, you are like, oh my God, I don't know how to do this. I can't do this. I suck as a writer, all this other stuff. And one of the things that I did was like, hold up, wait, let's, let's really break this down. All right. I have 75,000 words. I need to have it done in let's say 18 months. All right. How many, how much do I really want to write on this? And then when you start breaking it down and start chipping away at those those objections, you really see that it only takes 250 words a day for four days a week over 18 months to get to 75,000 words. The same thing is true with exercise and fitness, right? Like all of that stuff builds upon the top of each other. So the thing that we're really trying to do is build momentum. And once we get momentum, it's, it's harder to stop. Yeah, I think that's so true. Right. And it's even like when you talk about it with running, it's probably just a matter of like, just put on the shoes and go outside and just move them for like five minutes and then see, you know, what happens. Yeah. And then most of the time what happens is people are like, well, I'm out here now. Yeah. So you might as well keep on going. Yeah. Yeah. So when you trained and prepared for your first marathon, like how long did that take you? Like from when you were at the doctor's office to when you decided like you were actually gonna like, you know, the first marathon that you ran, how many, what was the time frame there? So it took me about 18 months from when I met the doctor to when I actually trained for it. I was very methodical. Some people would think like that's super fast. Like I was having a conversation with somebody and was like, it only took you 18 months? Like, dang, that's fast. And some people was like, oh, that's super slow. But I was very methodical, right? Like my first run was 15 seconds. So I would literally go back the next day, build up, right? And then next thing you know, minutes became miles. So I remember when I went from telling my significant other, oh, I'm going on a 12-minute run, run to like, oh, I'm running my first mile, right? Like that was the celebration. And the same thing is true with, you know, training. So I, I started running 5Ks, then started running some 10Ks. And then throughout the whole year, like I ran races until I ran my first half marathon. And by then, like the year was kind of over with. So New Year's Day of uh, of 2013, I remember talking to my significant other and being like, oh, I'm going to run this marathon. And her telling me, well, which one are you going to run? I was like, well, I think I'm going to run Detroit. And she's like, well, do you know what it is? 
And I'm like, not really. So then I get on the internet and start typing in Detroit Marathon. And I was like, oh, registration is open today. I'm going to sign up right now. And then signed up right then and there. And I was like, okay, I got 10 months. So I got 10 months to make this happen. Wow. And so how did it feel when you finished the first marathon? Oh, man, it was amazing. That feeling of crossing the finish line was like no other feeling that I've ever felt before. However, there was a large crash that comes along with it. So there's this thing called post-race blues, or as I like to call post-marathon depression, right? And this is where you put all of your eggs in one basket, right? Like you spend all of this time focusing on, on, on this one particular thing. You then co- accomplish it, and then you feel empty afterwards. Like you feel, first you feel elated, and then that feeling goes away, and then you just, just feel with emptiness. And that's what happened with me as well. Mm-hmm. How did you handle that? Therapy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I suppose it was like so much of your focus and, and like identity. And then to have that, you know, milestone pass, it's like via, you, know, you know, kind of a void, I'm assuming. It was a void. Therapy. And one of the things my therapist was like, well, what's stopping you from front time up for another race? Or like, what's stopping you from having multiple races on your calendar so you don't have to feel that? Cause you always, is chasing, you're chasing multiple races throughout the year versus that one race. And I was like, hmm, okay. And that's where like race stacking came into play. So, you know, travel all over the world and just do races. So like I'm, I'm, I'm in Florida one weekend, next thing you know, I'm in Boston another weekend. And that's where for me, running became super fun because you start to meet with the same people over and over again. So imagine being in the back and you'd be like, well, what races are you running? And I say, oh, I'm running X, Y, and Z. And I say, well, dang, I never ran that race. I think I'm going to run it with you. And next thing you know, you got running buddies all over the world. Like that's how I got some of my closest friends now is from running races and asking them, hey, what race are you going to run? And us being like, you know what? This is fun. Like we're, we're going to run this race together. And like, yeah. The next thing you know, we were running all the races together. Yeah. Amazing. So you, you know, you really kind of like embrace the slow AF run club. Like what I appreciate about that as someone who is slow AF is that it's like, just, just kind of own it (laughs) is like, just, you know, instead of, you know, feeling shame or inadequacy for sort of being slower or being, you know, towards the back or last, like to embrace it. Is that sort of the, the message that you're. Absolutely. Encouraging people to have, yeah. You know, our mission at the Slow Life Run Club is to empower 1 million people to start running in the body that you have right now. You know, there's so many people like, I could be a runner, but I got I to gotta lose weight first. And it's like, no, you don't. Who told you that? That was dumb. You can be a runner right now in the body you have right now. It may look different from what you see online. Like, we, we have to maybe adjust your expectations. But you can be a runner. You can be active. And I think that's the thing, right, is that taking a punishment out of physical activity or exercise or whatever you want to call it. And just letting people know that like, Hey, there's so many benefits, so many other benefits to having regular physical activity that you're going to re- relegate it to a number on the scale. Like shit. What about your blood pressure? What about your a one C's? What about all the other things? Friendship, you know, meeting new people, traveling around the world, all the other things that running can bring to you, but you want to focus on a number on a scale. Why? Why? Because society told you to, that's dumb. <laughs> and I, and I think that's the thing, right? Like if, if, if many of us, if we could just take a second to really think about diet culture and their, their thinking when it comes to some of this stuff, you can actually think yourself out of this and be like, wait a minute. That don't make sense. Why, why would I want to do that? Like, why would you want to do that? And, you know, and, I, and one of the things I like to do, and this is why I like running at the body that you are right now, providing joy, right? You know, one of the things like we like to say is, you know, you know, what if the answer to this quote unquote health crisis in the United States is joy, not shame. So like we've tried shame for so long. That shit ain't working. Let's try joy. (laughs) You know, let's try joy. You know, 
running has took me so many places, right? And I and these are like stories I like to tell people. My most fondest fondest memory of running was running in London looking for trickle pudding. So I was at a conference in London, never been in London, and asking all of the members, hey, like, what food or things should I experience in London? Like, I've never been. Like, I know y'all got bangers and mash. I know y'all got fish and chips. But like, what else should I get? And somebody was like, oh, you should get trickle pudding. So for that whole conference, after I did my presentation, me and my friend, we ran around London going pub to pub, and just be like, hey, this is a weird question, but do you have trickle pudding? And they'll be like, no. I'm like, ah. And then we'll, we'll run to the next pub and just laugh and have fun. And like, that's the most fondest memory of, of running that I have is running around London, looking at stuff, stopping at random pubs and being like, hey, do you have trickle pudding? And they'd be like, no. And then like, we'll, we'll try to like add some, um, some voices to it. So like, you know, you know, that commercial was like, hello, sir, by chance, you have great coupon. So that, that, that'd that be us like walking into the, um, um, walking into the pub and be like, hello, good sir. How are you doing? By chance, do you have any trickle pudding? And they'll just look at us like, no. And then we're like, okay. And just run out and just go to the next place. Like, don't, don't y'all want that? Like, isn't that more fun? Isn't that more enjoyable? You know, joyful? Isn't that more, does not fulfill your life more than like looking at a number on a scale that can change, you know, regardless of like what you do? Like that, to me, like that's more of a life more fulfilled having that experience than looking at a number on the scale. Yeah, I love that. I have, what is trickle pudding? <laughs> Oh man! So peep this out, <laughs> Summer. <laughs> we never got it. <laughs> okay, so maybe it's not like a widespread. <laughs> <laughs> we never got it. We end up getting something called sticky toffee put sticky toffee pudding, which is like somewhat okay. similar to it. Okay, but we never got trickle pudding. I gotta ask. I have a couple of British friends. I'm gonna ask them <laughs> what this thing is. <laughs> Did you ever go back to the doctor to say, "Hey, I ran a marathon"? Unfortunately not. I moved around a lot. So, well, first I wasn't planning on going back to the doctor anyway, but I moved around a lot. So, you know, after I seen that doctor, I end up having to go to another doctor so I can get properly diagnosed to get together. So went through that doctor, went to physical therapy and things of that sort. And then after that, I kind of moved from that state. So I was in Connecticut. So I moved and he just became like, a mythical story than like the actual person because like he can walk right past me and I wouldn't even know or know what he looked like. I know what he, you know what they say. People forget what you say, but they they'll remember how how you made them feel, and that's the mm -hmm. same thing. Yeah, not that you ever have to prove yourself to him, anyways. But but I was just curious about that. So tell everyone just I guess a little bit about like who the book is for and where they can find the book and everything else that you offer. Absolutely. This is my favorite part. Slow F Run Club, the ultimate guide for anybody who wants to run is available wherever books are sold. So Barnes and Noble, Amazon, your favorite indie store, you can find it there. We are doing signed copies at an independent bookstore called Pocket Books. So they're a, a small, independent, women-led bookstore in Pennsylvania. I'm actually driving to Pennsylvania and gonna go hand sign a bunch of books. So that would be the only place where you'll be able to buy an autograph book from me is at Pocket Books. So you can sh go to shop. No, it's called pocketbookshop.com. Search for the book, buy it, and then you'll get an autograph copy. Who the book is for? I wanna say everybody. But this book, if if you are an individual who wants to start running or thinking about running, this book is for you. If you are an individual who are like interested in stories and just other stories about people's journeys, this book is for you because that's in there. If you are interested in just the technical aspect of what goes through my mind as a 300 pound runner, this book is for you. What I took from this book or like what I tried to do with this book is take some of my favorite stories that I've experienced in running and smashed it with, with how-to stuff 
that so that way it can be a little bit more interesting because most how to running books are dry literally they're dry like you can probably watch paint dry and be more entertained than what's in actually these books so my goal was to make this book entertaining make you have some feelings but also learn something along the way I love it. I love the stories so much. It was great. And, and, and like the how to was laid out really, really well too. So I appreciate that. And you talk about the gear and everything that you need and what to do. And, uh, and so I, I, I like really, it made me think like maybe I could run more, but I, I still don't know <laughs> if I will, <laughs> but, but if I do, I will, <laughs> I will use the how to, but I loved reading the stories regardless. And so you mentioned like that you that you have like the club, like the Slow AF Run Club. What's that? So the Slow AF Run Club is a global community of 10,000 members worldwide. We house everything inside of an app on iOS and Android. So for anybody listening, you can go download the Slow AF Run Club app on your favorite iPhone device or Android device. Right. So it's a community that when I started this run club, you know, it was an in-person thing, but it happened right before the pandemic happened. So when the pandemic happened, I pivoted and made it completely virtual. So now this is where, you know, we have 10,000 members all over the world. So some of the things that we have in there is like online training plans. We have a uh, personal trainer who does fitness classes, live stream fitness classes, and they're super accessible every week. You know, you got live streams from yours truly in there. And then one of the things that we're working on that I'm really excited about is that we're launching a nonprofit portion or nonprofit arm of the Slow Your Front Club. And with this, you'll be able to apply to launch your own Slow Your Front Club in your own particular neighborhood. So I'm really excited about that as well, because that really helps out with the mission of getting 1 million people to start running in the body they have right now. Yeah. And you have merch, as I yeah, see. From the, uh, I love the turtle mascot. Thank you. <laughs> we have merch. Our merch goes from size uh, in most cases, maybe extra small to size 6X. So we're super accessible. Yeah, I love it. Amazing. And of course, I'll link to everything else. You have a podcast, you have your Instagram. I assume you're everywhere else, but I'll link through all of it in the show notes. And I just want to say thank you so much for being here today, Martinez. It was really great getting to know you better. Thank you for having me, Summer. Rock on. I love that conversation. I hope that you check out martinez online at 300 pounds and running and if you want to run or even just be inspired by someone who has overcome and done so much to do something as incredible as running a marathon which like i can't even fathom doing for myself then definitely pick up a copy of the slow af run club book that is coming out on june 6th and you can find all the other links mentioned in this episode at summerinandin.com forward slash 267. Thank you so much for being here today. Rock on. I'm Summer Inanin, and I want to thank you for listening today. You can follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Summer Inanin. And if you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts, search Eat the Rules, and subscribe, rate, and review this show. I would be so grateful. Until next time, rock on.